Welcome to The Thriving Marriage, the podcast for those who want to get their spouse back in love with them and truly thrive. You'll learn why 95% of people don't save their marriage and the secret method no one else is talking about that will change everything for you. Are you ready? 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 Let's Let's turn turn tragedy tragedy to triumph. triumph. Here are your hosts, international marriage experts, Mark Johnston and Heather Choate. So welcome everyone here today. My name is Heather Choate and I am here with Mark Johnston. How are you doing, Mark? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Doing really good. My husband and I took some time, went to Alaska and it was an incredible getaway. Had some awesome adventures. Um, Got to do some dog sledding. Well, technically there wasn't enough snow to go dog sledding, which was weird because there was like still two inches, but I guess they need like eight inches. So the dogs pulled us on a side by side. (laughs) I saw some of the pictures from your your trip. It looked looked amazing. Yeah, it was really, really great. Anyway, so today we're talking about text to connect and specifically four texts that will get them to want to spend time with you. And we're also going to talk about what texts you absolutely should not send and how we're going to help you open up communication even if they're closed off, even if they're ignoring your texts, misunderstanding you, or they're pulling further away. This episode is definitely going to be for you. And we want you to stay tuned to the end because we have a special announcement, something that you don't want to miss if this speaks to you. So (laughs) before we get to that, though, I'm going to share the client win of the week. And this one's shared with permission from Stacy. And she says, thank you so much. The PATH program has helped me to look at the bigger picture for sure and feel more in control over what's happening by feeling like there is something I can do to help the situation. That's stopped me acting on emotions at times when I usually would have. And uh, I know personally, I can also attest to this, that focusing on the things that we can control and shifting that focus is probably more important now than ever before. A lot of people have never gone through the kind of challenges that we're facing right now. And with the pandemic, with our relationships, um, with you know, politics and all of these different things going on, have a lot of people feeling a lot of uncertainty, a lot of anxiety, and even some hopelessness. And one thing that's been a powerful mindset shift for me is that most of us, 90% of the time, we're focusing on things that we have no control over. And we tend to worry over those things and stew over those things and rage about those things. Sometimes we get so angry and we get contentious about those things. Um, but really um, empowerment and peace and security comes when we shift our focus 90% of the time to the things that we can control. Be aware of the things that we can't control, but don't put most of our focus there. And so Stacy's learning to do that as well as the other you know, practices that we teach in the PATH program. And I'm grateful that she's been able to apply that and that it's helping her uh, right now during this time. Because I know, like many of you, I need it as well. <laughs> so it's awesome. Yeah, I've actually had a, a chance to speak with Stacy on a number of occasions. She's actually really come a far, a long, long way. And I will say that that's probably one of the biggest things that has helped her along that uh, that journey. Just exactly what she's talking about here is being able to look at the situation, examine what she can control, and actually focus on that. She's in a much more comfortable position. Uh, she's also, you know very far along the way of making everything work out with her with her husband. So it's it's going really well. Glad to hear from you. Yeah. yeah, I could go down a huge rabbit hole on that, but I truly believe it's not about the things that happen to us in our lives. We're all going to face really challenging circumstances. It's truly what we choose to do about it and where we choose to put our focus and empowering ourselves to take action in the direction of who we're really meant to be. So with that being said, let's talk about texting. Texting. Uh, <laughs> So texting, I just want to start and say that, first of all, to me, texting has its place. It's not a, like the most ideal form of communication, but it's so prevalent that we can't kind of ignore it. So mm-hmm. that being said, and then I know we also kind of look at some things of like a silver bullet. Like we think that, oh, this is the, the one thing that's going to yeah. save me, right? <laughs> So what's been your experience with that, Mark? Well, I, 
I, you know what? What's interesting is when we were deciding on this topic, I, we actually came up, uh, upon this topic because of votes from the community. Uh, and, you know, usually when I am writing on a topic, I'll, I'll go and look at what other people have to say, other experts have to say on, on it. And, you know, I saw so, so, so many <laughs> articles and um, opinions on, you know, texting to get your, your ex back and things like that. Um, and I, my concern with a lot of them was that they were positioning their their method, their texting method, as the one thing that would that would um, you know win it all. Now I did see a few that had some disclaimers, and I actually really appreciated this. But you know, when you, you're talking there, Heather, about the silver bullet, mm -hmm. I w I want to start this discussion off by saying this is not a silver bullet, and a silver bullet doesn't exist. And what I what we we're talking about when we say silver bullet, you know, we're I, I don't know exactly where the phrase came from, but I, I almost like to think that it's that that idea of like, you know, the, the monsters and, you know, you have a silver bullet and it's the one thing that's going to kill them. Same sort of thing here. You know, do we have, is, is texting the one thing that, the one piece that you need to, to get, to solve this big problem? And that's why it's so appealing. The, the idea that if we just change this one small thing, if we do this one simple task, then all of our problems will be solved. I don't know, Heather, if you've had any experiences in your life where you've been looking for a silver bullet. I, I know I have uh, uh, here and there. Um, you know, I know me personally, uh, earlier on in in my marriage with, with Jen, uh, you know, sometimes I'd be in this sort of, we'd be in these financial <laughs> periods of time where we are not doing as well financial and I'd be like, okay, what's the one thing that I have to do to, to start earning money? And I'd be like, I'd be looking up, like get, get rich quick, earn money fast sort of things. And I, I just, I learned that those sort of approaches were like the one step solutions just didn't really lead anywhere. Right. And I, I don't know if you've, you or Ben have, been in those sort of circumstances it's just oh yeah well one of the things that human nature is we're always looking for like the easy thing and especially in our day and age we want like everything now we want instant gratification the whole idea of like patience and the long road is something that we weren't really brought up with right we've got like microwave dinners like instant gratification for all these different things um and so it's just human nature to look for the easiest simplest fastest route and marketers know that and I'm a marketer, <laughs> right? And so sometimes um, we take advantage or, or kind of, you know, lean into that desire for an easy way out or a simple solution. Um, and so there's definitely been times when we've done that too. Um, you mentioned career and finances, definitely been there as well as, you know, even with, you know, nutrition, weight loss, those kind of things. We're looking for the fastest, most effective way. And we do like this crazy crash diet and then it totally backfires <laughs> because we're not building real long sustainable change. And so I like that we're talking about this because while it's an element of a relationship, we're kind of like doing the microscope approach to a bigger issue. And if we can look at this in the long term, term perspective, let's use this as like a launch pad or a way to start to see some quick wins, right? Some momentum. It is going to help get you in the right direction, especially if your texting has not been um, healthy or effective or it's been backfiring. We'll talk about what messages, text messages you should never send, right? So we can use this as a launch pad to start getting some momentum in the right direction. But just like a rocket takes off, like it uses 90% of its fuel to get out of the atmosphere, this is going to be like the 2% of the fuel, right? We're going to need a lot more fuel to get out of the atmosphere here to really get some, some good results. So, so I, yeah, I like to look at this as like, okay, this solution is really good for solving or accomplishing certain things. And so when we're talking about <coughs> effective text messaging, we're looking at, what kind of problems, what kind, what kind of things can it accomplish? Uh, and I think that really depends on where you are at with your relationship. Now, I, I'm going to assume that a lot of people who are really interested in this are at a stage where they're saying, okay, I don't have much communication with my spouse. I 
there's maybe a lot of tension, a lot of contempt going on. Uh, maybe tempers have been <laughs> growing. Uh, I, I, that's what I'm seeing. Now, I do absolutely think that there's some great things that you can do with text messages, even in a healthy marriage. I, I actually want to talk a little bit about that later, but basically the, the things that we're trying to accomplish, we're trying to break the ice. Um, you and your, your partner might not have been talking. We need to, to ease into that. We need, need to create some comfort. We need to reduce some tension and we need to create some interest. Uh, this is what we're trying to accomplish with the text messages. And I'm going to, I'm saying that because I want to say a little bit what it's not. This is not like this big thing that's going to win your, your spouse back. Uh, it's not going to be the, the, the one thing that's going to absolutely change their mind completely. But like, like Heather said, it is going to create some momentum and it's going to create some progress. And from there you can, we can take some other steps. So why are text messages a good idea? If we're trying to accomplish these things, we're trying to break the ice and create comfort and create some interest. Um, why is it a really good idea when communication is poor? Um, I do think that text messages, you know, as much as I, I <coughs> honestly, I don't really like texting a lot, but text messages have become a very casual way to communicate. And I, I do appreciate that about them. And it, I will say that a lot of times um, when uh, a, a marriage is going really uh, south, uh, when a lot of forms of communication have been cut off, almost, almost always, uh, the, for my clients, uh, there, there's still text, texting going on. For some reason, that's like the, that's the last the last stage, the last thing that will be cut off. They might cut off in-person uh, communication. They might cut off phone calls or emails, but they'll keep text messages around. And why? Because often text, times text messages are very low pressure. Um, you can answer it when, when you please. You don't have to answer it right away. It allows you some time to think about your response, and it's a safe environment to communicate, meaning like one of the big things that you can do is if it's not going your way, if it's becoming uncomfortable, if that tension is picking up, either one of you can step away from your phone and it's not a big deal. So there's a lot of advantages to using text messages at a stage when the relationship is poor. So yes, I would agree with that. <laughs> one reason why text message is not my favorite way to communicate, even in a healthy relationship, um, some of the cons, right, is that it's so hard to understand the meaning someone has behind something. It's so easy to misunderstand. We know that communi like communication is so much percentage of body language and voice inflection, and all those things are truly lost if it's just words on a screen. And so it's really hard to interpret and, and to communicate accurately. Um, so that's why we're gonna talk about some things that you absolutely don't want to do so that you don't have your, you know, your spouse further misunderstand you, further pull away from you and have this, you know, kind of backfire. Now, I do wanna point out that um, today we're essentially scratching the surface on a lot of this. Uh, we actually do, because you all voted on this topic, we, we put together a mini workshop and we go over a lot more in, in that workshop. And I'm sure, Heather, you're already planning on mentioning that at the end. But mm -hmm. like I, I just want to point out, we're just scratching the surface here. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why texting is um, not a great idea. And in the workshop, I go over a lot of what you can do to get around that. We just don't have time here today. <laughs> All right. Uh, so what are some text messages, Mark, that we should absolutely never send? Yes. So the there are several here. And like I said, we go over even some more in the, in the mini workshop. But I think confrontational text messages are really, really not a good idea to, to send to you, your partner. Uh, these are, I, and I don't know if I see this all the time, confront, trying to confront really big problems out of the blue over text messages is not a good idea. I'll, I'll, I, I've had some clients share their text messages between uh, their partner and that, them with me. And I'll see things like, you know, uh, the beginning of a text chain where uh, it starts off, I can't believe you did that. 
you know, just kind of this ominous confrontational statement or, you know, just the, the starting off with accusations. Like, I know you're with her, you know, mm -hmm. and referring to being with a, an affair partner potentially. And a lot of times what this is, uh, what's going on with something like this confrontational text message is there's really, really no way to respond well in a, in a circumstance like that, unless the person is uh, just going to completely bend over backwards to be, to be nice or to be understanding, but which is probably not the case in, in your situation if you're sending a text message like that. You know, Heather, like say you or I who are in healthy relationships, if I, if I saw a message like that from my wife, okay, you know, I, that would be fine. I, I would need to know uh, what's going on, but that's, you know, like I said, if you're having to confront someone like that over text, probably isn't a good situation to be doing that over text. And it's very likely, like Heather said, for there to be misunderstanding, for there to be defensiveness going on, and it's just not going to end well. It's going to create more division. Right. To be, it's going to be ineffective at best. It's going to backfire at worst. Uh, just kind of snowball into creating more tension, more defensiveness. And is that how you really are going to solve your problem? If your goal is to solve this issue, you know, in a healthy way, <laughs> is that really the best way to go about it? Now, I, I will say that there have been times when I, you know, Ben and I have had um, a challenge with each other or an issue. And I will say, you know, are you good if we talk sometime? There's something I want to talk about when in the next 24 hours, can we talk about it? I might send that kind of text, but more often than not, I actually say it in person. But that isn't going into the issue right then and expecting for it to be resolved, right? It's just an invitation to talk about something later in person. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, we're not even saying don't confront at all over text messages. It's it's more like this uh, sort of idea where you're starting off the, the message or even the intention is only to confront. Like it's, it's a very one-sided sort of idea. Like if you had a very understanding message on top of that confrontation, uh, it probably would be just fine if you're saying, hey, this is, you know, I'm having a big problem with this. I know that you're hurting too, and I'd like to talk about it sometime. Mm -hmm. That's much, much better. But yes, like the the, the brief examples that I gave are, aren't going to go anywhere. Right. What else? We've got the, you know, don't launch into accusations and confrontational text messages. Mm -hmm. What's another one that we should never send? There should never, you should never really be sending needy or insecure text messages. Um, you know, a lot, I'm going to point out a lot of these, a lot of these, the, the big thing that it has in common, not, not all of them, but the emotion, the problem with it is that emotions are running high when the text message is sent. And, um, especially if you're trying to create more connection, you're really needing an emotionally safe environment. Uh, and then we, we actually talked a little bit about that in a podcast, like, well, it wasn't last week, but I think it was the week before. Um, where I, I mentioned, hey, you know, there needs to be, especially when you're trying to create this emotionally safe environment, you need that sense of confidence, a sense that, you know, you can discuss ideas without being swept up in the emotion. And a needy or insecure message is really, really kind of, it, it's, it's not pleasant to deal with. The, some examples of this, you might send the, uh, your spouse or partner might be out late with some friends and you might send a message like, don't you love me anymore? Now it might not be quite that obvious. Like, why don't you want me around? Uh, don't you even want to be with me? Can we, or, you know, let's say that the problems have um, progressed further and you're saying, can't we at least be friends? I just, I still want to be with you. I still love you. Can't you see that? And do you hear you know, even without like me feeling this, but even just those those words, you can hear all, all that insecurity and neediness. And the big commonality with a lot of those is that it's a focus on, on yourself and a desire for them to understand you without 
given any of that understanding in return. That's a lot what that that uh, needy or insecure um, kind of sense is. It's it's a focus on self without regarding the other person. I, you know, if you're saying I, I can't we at least be friends? I still love you. Can't can't we work things out? Can't we be together? And they're telling you that they need space or time, and you're ignoring that. That's it's going to be off putting. They're going to feel like you're not listening to them and they're going to distance themselves further. Right. And if you're doing any of these things, just know they're not alone. This is very, very common mistakes. A lot of people make, um, they get into that fear. It gets into the fight, flight or freeze response. Right. And a lot of that neediness, that desperation comes in and we talk about it in the push versus pull method. Part of our path method here is that when you try to push your spouse, to come back to you, push them to work on the marriage with you. You show them, I'm going to fight for our marriage. I'm going to, I, I love you no matter what, even like things that you might think are positive and might pull them back towards you are actually going to push them further away. I can remember an example of a client that would text his wife like five times every day. I'm not giving up on us and send her pictures of their early married days and their happy memories and, and all these things. And he thought if he could like show her and remind her of, all the good times that they had and prove to her, I'm willing to fight for a marriage that she would want to come back to him. But she had already said, I don't want to be with you. I don't like you texting me. And so he continued to do this driven by that, that kind of fear and desperation, that neediness. And it wasn't until we showed him, look, you're actually not respecting what she's asking. It is pushing her further away. So if you find yourself doing any of those things, you're not alone, but just realize that it's, it's again, going to only push them further away. So there's things that we definitely want to do instead. And we'll go into that in the next part. Um, so we've got the needy insecure, kind of the pushing, that desperation that kind of comes through. You feel so afraid. So you just are like, I got to do this, right? That impulsive drive. When you feel that, you really need to kind of check that emotion there before you send that kind of communication. All right. And then what is the last kind of text message that we should not send? So you shouldn't be sending what I, what I would call dead end text messages, messages that don't really go anywhere. Um, now this is something that I learned about in, in school. So, you know, when, in learning to, to work in the mental health field, you know, there, there's a lot of classes on, on interviewing skills. Basically, how do you, how do you talk to people? How do you ask questions? And I remember one of the big things that was drilled into me over and over again was the difference between uh, open-ended questions versus closed-ended questions. And if you're trying to get someone to talk, you don't ask closed-ended questions. And what a, what a closed-ended question is, is a question that um, basically can be answered in one or two words and doesn't give any anywhere else for the conversation to go. Like, for instance, you might say to yourself, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna check in with my spouse and you know, I'm gonna ask them how their day is. You know, hey, how's your day? Fine. All right, well, where, did that, where does that conversation go? Um, hey, can I, can I pick up the kids later? Yes, no. Okay, well, then that conversation doesn't go anywhere. And this is more like if you, you've got some communication going and you're trying to open it up a little bit, you want to have more of those open-ended questions uh, where you're actually asking them to engage with you. You know, you might send a, a, a text message, you know, asking, you know, asking about their opinion on, you know, some restaurant that you, you, you may be taking the kids to. Or you might be looking for some advice on, you know, on something that they're knowledgeable about. These are these are uh, conversations and questions that are going to lead to more conversation. Similarly, like you know, there's a few things that are just going to end in a dead end. So that's one close-ended questions. Another is going to be these explanations, basically telling your partner about something without relating relating it to them. And I find this mistake happening more often, not in like failed relationships because, or failing relationships, because your, your partner, if the relationship is really failing, they're just gonna cut you off. They're not gonna wanna listen to it.
But if you go on and on about your favorite interest or hobby and you don't relate the conversation back to them, they're going it, to, it's just not going to feel like very engaging. It's not going to feel like you actually care that they're in the conversation. I, what's, what's funny about this is I, I have to, um, you know, I will see this with clients, but this is something I actually have to talk to my uh, seven-year-old about. <laughs> is he'll go and he'll he'll tell me all about his favorite video game that he's playing and he wants me to listen to him but at no point is he engaging me in the conversation so i said hey look i'd like to have a conversation about this but oddly enough you know not everyone learns those sort of conversation skills um you know and just to reiterate you know back on what we were talking about earlier those confrontational text messages are you know another dead end text message or argumentative text messages that really provide no positive option for response. These are messages like you know that typically sound like an accusation. You know you might hear <laughs> I've actually seen messages like this, like where they say, "What are you an idiot or something?" And <laughs> in response to like not understanding what is being said. And the point that I'm making with something like that is there's really nowhere for that conversation to go. They can fight against you and then they don't understand you or they can say they can say yes and now they're they <laughs> they're basically demeaning themselves. You know, these argumentative texts, uh, accusations, things like this aren't just they're going to end in a dead end and you're you're very likely going to get no response or a very curt response. Yeah. So really watch out for name calling, blaming those accusations. Yeah. All right. So those are the kind of texts that we should never send because they do not work. And hopefully maybe you've had some aha moments. Again, remember, Mark and I give it to you like chop, chop, chop sometimes. <laughs> but uh, we do it, you know, to help you get some awareness that maybe these things have been happening in some of your communication patterns. Maybe you weren't even aware of them. Maybe in your life, this was the only way that communication was modeled for you. Because for most of us, we are not taught how to communicate in healthy ways. That is not something that's modeled for us. And so just recognize, okay, I can see that, yeah, I am doing some of these things. And that awareness is powerful because now you can say, I can choose to do it a different way. I can choose not to keep the cycle going and just to live out what was modeled for me or what I've always done. And I can learn a better way, even with such, such a simple but important thing as text messaging. Um, this is an important point you're saying like, yeah, sometimes, well, you, you kind of mentioned this. I think sometimes it's really easy to miss these mistakes uh, when you are sending messages like this, like I said, there there are times when, um, you know, when I'm really confused about some of the results uh, from, you know, when I've suggested things to clients. So I have I asked to take a look at some of their communication, and uh, you know, I remember one in particular. Uh, this guy sent me a few pages worth of text messages between him and his wife, and he's saying, "I look, I'm trying to be nice here. I don't know why she's." Uh, backing off and peppered throughout this were all these um, all these confrontations and I, I, I asked about this and I said okay well what is what is this right here 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 and here and he says well she was the you know she's the one that's doing and I, I can't remember what, what exactly it was I think it was like trying to keep my my son from me um, and I'm just telling her you know, I'm just standing up for myself or I'm telling her how it is. And I'm, I'm trying to set some boundaries like you said I should. And I was like, okay, he just wasn't seeing it. And th this is the point I'm making here is it's really hard to notice sometimes when you've gotten into some of these patterns because you, you might be used to it. You might, uh, you might be justifying it. it might, you know, you, you might have a really good reason for sending some of these messages. Like, you know, in the example given, this gentleman was standing up for himself or setting boundaries or um, trying to make, make sure that he can be there for his son. And when really it was coming across as argumentative and blunt and very severe and, you know, a lot of accusations were going in. in that. Yeah. One of the things I love about the coaching is that our clients will often send in like, oh, my goodness, I just got this text message from my spouse 
I'm tempted to say this, or is this the right response? And they'll send it in to us. And then their coach will give them feedback and show them, okay, sometimes we can coach you on literally word by word, what to say, how to actually convey what you're meaning in a way that goes through the next points that we're going to talk about so that it doesn't backfire. It actually increases connection and actually increases opportunities to communicate more and understand each other more um, and then build that, that connection there so they want to spend more time with you. So let's talk about a little bit. I know this is just the high level overview. We're not going super deep into this, but we do want to give you some solutions um, and then we'll go deeper into it in our workshop that we're going to do on text messaging. But how do we really text effectively? How do we do it in a way that accomplishes that, you know, that connection, opening up communication and increasing a desire for them to want to spend time with us? So, yeah, the big thing here, um, well, there's actually a lot of <laughs> many things, but uh, I, I think if you can stick to at least this first principle, you're, you'll do pretty good. Uh, we'll have several to talk about, though. The first one is to, to be an ally, um, meaning you do have to have a lot of respect and support for their choices and goals. Now, that doesn't mean that you give up, that you throw your marriage away or anything just because they say that they're done, but you can't be seen as someone who's fighting against what they're looking for. Now, this is something that I will say over and over and over again is, you know, if, if you're, well, I, I can almost imagine your response as I'm saying this, you're saying, well, my spouse wants a divorce. How can I support that? And this is something I tell my clients over and over again is divorce isn't what they, they want. It's, it's the way that they're going to get what they want. It's a means to an end. And quite often, you know, why people are wanting divorce is they're wanting to, to feel like they're heard, they want to feel loved, they want to feel respected, uh, they want to be able to you know, maybe have some time for themselves and not have to focus on other people's needs. And those are things that you absolutely can support, that you should support, and your text messages should reflect these sort of things. Uh, this is a general principle, not just a text messaging principle. You have to be seen as an ally and helping support the positive things that your spouse does want if you're going to even remotely have a chance at getting them to consider the relationship again. Um, I don't know about you, Heather, but you know, there, there's been times in my marriage where there are things that, you know, Jen and I might not agree on or we might not share the, the same interests, but I'll, I'll tell you the moments where I feel really close to her is when I know that she is supporting me in the things that I want, even if that's not necessarily the thing that she wants as well. Uh, and, and these aren't like even huge things. This is, might be, you know, hobbies, interests. This might be, you know, wanting to take a vacation <laughs> at a certain place or something as simple as that. But um, one, I'll even give a, a, a harder example. I'm thinking of like, you know, Jen and I might have different parenting styles. Um, well, we, it's not that we might have, we do have slightly different parenting styles. And, you know, there are times when I'm saying, okay, it's really important that the kids, uh, my children mind what I'm saying and have some respect for us as, as parents. And when I, when I say that, when I say that this is really important to me, Jen is that ally and she supports me on, on that goal. Um, yes, we're talking about text messages, but yeah, I think it applies here in text messages as well as in just general interactions. Yeah, it has to. And that's why we always start with what we call the root assessment in our coaching, is we need to know what is behind their decision, right? We, they, they, they say, I, I love you, but I'm, I'm not in love with you. I'm in love with someone else. Uh, you won't ever change or the change is just temporary. I can't be happy here. I need space. I need to find myself. All these things that your spouse says. And those are the surface level things that we hear. And if you focus only on those, then we're not uncovering the real reasons of what they're actually looking for, mm -hmm. right? 
I, I need to find myself. It means, you know, like maybe they're looking for more growth or more security in something. And that's why it's really hard to see that ourselves and why we need that kind of um, outside perspective to diagnose what's going on underneath. Then when we can uncover what they're actually looking for, they're looking for more fulfillment or they're looking for more connection or looking for more time to themselves, whatever it is, then like Mark said, we can support them in that goal because that's actually a good thing. If we look at it for like the truth in the heart, we all as human beings crave those things, right? We all have the same six basic human emotional needs. So and that's why we can never just isolate one thing. <laughs> Otherwise, then we're looking for a silver bullet that won't work. So yeah. that being said, that's why we do have the entire path process that we do in our coaching. And that's why we're saying it's important that you incorporate those same things into text messaging as well. And so the big reason why I mentioned this principle here is, you know, did you hear some of those um, text messages not to send the confrontational text, the insecure and needy text. Th those are either uh, like directly combating against some of their goals or focusing on our goals to the exclusion of the other person. And in both of those cases, you're not being an ally. There's an, there isn't that respect, consideration, or support. So the the next um, principle here, or another thing to keep in mind. <clears throat> is to keep things light. Uh, if especially if your your goal here is breaking the ice, reestablishing some connection, creating some comfort, reducing tension, you don't want the majority of your text messages to be these dour, sad, angry, um, confrontational, combative text messages. You you want things to be reasonably enjoyable to be lighthearted, you know, poke some fun at some things you want, like your, your partner to come away from reading your text message to feel a little bit lighter inside, to feel a little bit happier. And, <laughs> and you're not going to get anywhere close to them. If, if that's not happening, they're closed off because they don't feel comfortable and you need to keep things light to get there. Right. We want to increase that comfort. We want to reduce some tension and have the interactions be enjoyable. We, what, one, one thing that we do here is we start talking about, I'm an ally, like show them I'm an ally to your goals. I respect and support you and your goals. That's going to get their attention. We talk about that in the path process, right? We get their attention. That's going to grab their attention. And then we're going to want to build some attraction there. How do we build attraction? We don't go about it by being super heavy all the time. I'm not saying that we ignore those issues because that's not what we do. But the tendency that Mark and I, and I know many people see here, is that we often want to just go to where it hurts most or try to get some resolution. We want them to leave the affair partner, right? We want to get out of the pain and we want to resolve those things. But we need to follow the process that's going to enable us to solve those deeper issues in the right time and in the right place. And it's attacking them with those all the time is not going to make you very attractive, right? It's going to make you someone that's not very enjoyable to be around. So we're not saying be inauthentic to your, to yourself. That's not what we're saying. But we are saying bring about the, the part of you that is attractive, that is fun to be around, that does increase comfort, that does reduce that tension so that they do want to spend more time with you. I think this, you know, I always like tying in uh, theories and principles uh, from other other areas. I think this really well uh, connects to uh, Dr. Gottman's principle, uh, his, his magic ratio, the five to one ratio. Mm -hmm. If you're not familiar with it, um, John Gottman, who's a, you know, huge in terms of marriage and relationship research, says that to, to maintain a stable relationship, you need at least five positive interactions to one negative interaction. And so this, this is what this is meant to do. You, you need to keep things more positive because if you start getting away from that, you know, high ratio positive to negative, your, your partner is going to start anticipating heavy conversations uh, and unpleasant conversations, and they're just not going to want to talk to you at all. Right. We talk about, you know, it's an energy drain rather than an energy filler. Mm -hmm. um, and so one, I just want to say that again, one little caution here is that, again, we're not saying be inauthentic. 
don't pretend to be Pollyanna. And that's just going to come across really fake. But, you know, there's a process there of finding like, what can I be really positive about right now? Right. And how can I be a little lighthearted about this? Right. How can I find some way to increase comfort and reduce tension? Uh, the the last one, if we're really trying to open things up, um, I imagine a lot of you probably get a lot of resistance. And I'll, I'm going to tell you, roll with it. Um, this is something that I've mentioned in a few other trainings, um, but it's it's an important principle, and that's why I keep repeating it. I, you know, is your partner upset? Okay. That's fine. Roll with that and, you know, see what can be done. Do they not want to talk anymore right now? That's fine. You're, you're going to get some anger. You're going to get some resistance. You're going to get some walls being put up. And if you fight against that, if you say, no, we have to talk right now. No, you, you don't get to be upset. I'm the one that's angry right now. If you say, no, like, I, I can't believe why you're so sad about this, right? You know, those are very harsh responses, but, you know, it touches on what I think a lot of people do respond in these cases. And really, what I, so what I mean here is you want to roll with it and say, okay, there's something going on here. I'm going to just say that this feeling, that this resistance that I'm seeing, there's a legitimate reason for it. And that's, that's what you need to, to say to yourself. The resistance I'm seeing is there's a reason for it. It's legitimate. The feeling is valid. Um, and if you can say that, it's going to be much easier for you to roll with the resistance and, as we said before, become that ally rather than the person that your partner needs to fight against. Beautiful. All right. Now let's talk about our text to connect formula. Yeah, so <laughs> I guess it's a high level overview, but a text to connect. Yeah, it's just, it's a basic, basic principles. You you basically want things to be casual, spontaneous, and purposeful. And you might say, okay, well, casual and purposeful don't really go together. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, these are the, the really simple principles, casual, spontaneous, purposeful, uh, if you want things to, to be connecting. So casual meaning you don't really have big plans. You're not trying to scheme. Uh, trying to win them back. Uh, this is a big thing that turns off a lot of people who are leaning away from the marriage. They, they think, okay, if my partner is planning this communication, if they're saying, okay, I need to send two text messages a day, and then you know this this one message here about the kids is really just trying to communicate to me and trying to get me back. You know, if there's the, those grand plans behind your messages. Um, they're just going to turn away from you. They're not going to want to talk. Right. It will feel like a manipulation. Yeah. So you exactly, that's, that's a, an excellent word I hear. And I hear that complaint all the time, all the time. So casual, make it very casual, make it spontaneous. Like maybe you haven't been looking for ways to connect or talk with them. It's not like you're planning this out. Um, you know, it's not like you've been sitting there trying to craft your message you're trying to make it make it perfect or something. You want this to feel very light and very easygoing and very it's 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 a normal thing to just reach out. And then lastly, purposeful, you know, it's going to be help, especially if tension is running a bit high, especially if there are some walls up that you connect it to a purpose. Um, are there some reasons why you are at, talking to them? So if we combine all of these, <clears throat> you might have a message, something like, hey, I just ran into my old friend and he reminded me of this time. Uh, he was talking to me about this time that we all went out together. That was a lot of fun. Hey, um, I, the main reason I'm calling or I'm texting though is to, to ask about our schedule later. Um, you know, about the kids. You know, we have some spontaneous thing here. We have some casualness but it has a purpose to it. These sort of messages make it um, make it comfortable to continue the conversation. It makes it comfortable to have more messages like this. You know, and we're going to get more specific uh, in in the workshop about specific kinds of messages you can send. But you know, it, 
we want to stick to these these kind of principles for the most part and and a lot of the the messages that are being sent especially at the early stages when we're trying to break the ice and create some comfort awesome so mark i'm curious what do text messages look like in a healthy marriage what do you, what are some of the kind of messages that you appreciate from from your wife so this is a very i i, I wanted to touch on this because this is very different from what we've been talking about um, the, the whole time we've been kind of talking about text messages in the context of a very unhealthy and broken relationship. Um, but you know, when, when you've gotten to a point where there is more connection and the, there is some desire to, to make things work, um, it looks very different. I know for me, uh, I, I love messages from, from Jen where we have some sort of inside sort of secret message, something that's only meant for say me and her. Messages where um, she's helping me to feel like she's she's thinking of me or that I'm the, uh, you know, the focus of some of her attention. You know, a lot of messages that are gonna communicate uh, some, some interest or desire to be around me or just some appreciation uh, for, for you know, something that's being done or our relationship in general. But like, do you hear a lot of these things? It's a, these text messages become uh, an opportunity to demonstrate focus, interest, connection, and are really great within a healthy relationship. But a lot of these things don't fit in kind of the broken stage of the, of the relationship. What about you? I mean, are there things that you hear from Ben um, that are really appreciated? Yeah, any time where, you know, I'm really, thank you for doing this, or I'm grateful that you did that, or words of encouragement, words of, you know, appreciation or acknowledgement, like, hey, you did really good, good job yesterday on doing your master class. That was awesome. Or, you know, I saw the way that you handled the kids last night with that when Benjamin blew up about this, right? <laughs> you did a good job. You know, those kind of things are really great. Um, but we do have our own like secret nerdy language that we've created, like just over the years, just different phrases and words that other people don't even know what they mean, you know? <laughs> and so we really like to, um, like you said, kind of like a secret or special text message that I know is just like really intimate between us, reminds us of really funny past memories and just words that become part of our language, I guess, our, our culture as a couple. Um, and so those are really fun. And of course, anything that's just flirty and lighthearted, anything that's like, you know, I'm thinking about you. I can't wait to wrap my arms around you tonight. I mean, I'm not going to go into like, you know, <laughs> like the really <laughs> seductive type texting, but there's definitely that lightheartedness, that, that fun, you know, I'm thinking about you. I'm looking forward to spending time with you tonight. I'm looking forward to our date, anything like that. Let's them know that I'm thinking about you and creates that intrigue and that interest and just lets each other know that we're on on each other's mind so it goes all the way from the deeper like i'm really grateful for you i appreciate this about you i acknowledge this about you i'm proud of you to the lighthearted, goofy dirty silly things um to then of course the more intimate spicy things <laughs> which make a relationship really fun um and i think that that is a great element to add to your relationship it's an easy way to let someone know in the middle of the day that you're thinking about them or to build some anticipation of when you're going to see each other again well i think really the the idea of having these kind of messages it's almost like passing passing notes oh. <laughs> like in like elementary <laughs> school, middle school high school it's that i have a, a a special message just for this person and it it it, it makes you feel special um i mean i, I think it it i i absolutely think it's the modern equivalent to the to that sort of thing of passing the note and to share that little secret with you it builds uh, with someone else it really builds that connection um to say that you and i have this certain thing that no one else has and what I what I tend to see is that text messages emphasize what's already existing within a relationship. That's why, you know, in a healthy, thriving relationship, you can have those flirty messages and those secret messages and those, you know, having that nerdy uh, code words and, and whatnot. It's already emphasizing what's already there. Similarly, if there's been a lot of tension and heartache and problems, 
if you're not carefully crafting your messages, it's much more likely to emphasize those things. And so that's why we have the, the workshop so that you can be much more mindful to turn that around. Yeah, with that being said, that's a great little segue. We've talked about how we are doing a workshop because you all asked for it. So that's pretty cool. You guys asked for it. This was your top choice. Um, and by far and large, many, many people said they want this. So we will be doing a mini workshop on this soon. I do not have a link to join. So the way to let us know if you want in on the workshop that will be happening in the next couple of weeks um, is to join our Thriving Marriage Facebook group and I know a lot of you are watching right now on the thriving marriage Facebook group leave a comment here on our podcast video and say me I want in let me know more about the workshop I definitely want to join or you can just privately message um, Mark Johnston or myself Heather Cho you can find us in that thriving marriage Facebook group if you're not a member you can just easily search thriving marriage group and you'll see us we have like 30 something thousand people which is awesome um, and we'd love to have you join us if you're not currently a member of that group. So you want in on the workshop, just leave a comment, say me, or reach out to Mark and I personally, and we'll make sure that we get you in on that workshop. Okay, I can see a couple of you already answering here in the Thriving Marriage Facebook group that you would love to join. So awesome. Now, drum roll. <laughs> Let's go to our marriage myth buster. <laughs> our marriage myth buster, and I really appreciate this one actually, is that therapy and coaching is only for completely broken couples, only if your marriage is on the rocks. Why is this a myth? This is actually something that I, I hear, not just with, um, for say relationship coaching, but I do think it's especially in relationship coaching or, or therapy, uh, because there's this kind of idea that, uh, if we can't handle our own problems, then what business do we have being together? Um, I, there is kind of this concept with say therapy, coaching or, or things like that, that it, you know, to go get help from a professional means that you are weak or that you uh, something along those lines. Uh, there's also a lot of resistance that people have. They say, okay, we, I don't want to air all our dirty laundry or talk to a stranger about what our, our problem is. And honestly, my, my opinion, now, obviously, <laughs> I think my opinion is going to be a little bit biased because I make my living <laughs> off of helping other people. Uh, but it's, it's a, those are all really garbage sort of excuses to, to not seek some support and help. The truth is that far too many people wait far too long before seeking help. I actually looked up the statistics on this. I thought this was really interesting. Is And statistically, most couples wait about six years after major problems start popping up in their relationship before seeking help. Hmm. Six years. Not know that. Wow. That is a it's a long time to let things fester and to get can, cantankerous and contemptuous and to really get to a point where it feels very broken. And it now I, I understand this, like because people don't typically make a lot of changes unless their current circumstances are really uncomfortable. But the thing is, most people would benefit from an outside perspective and some tools to maintain a relationship that that would be so much easier or to get some preventative sort of uh help i, I keep playing around with the the idea of at some point um <laughs> putting out like a completely different uh business or a completely different set of courses all on premarital counseling and whatnot just because i, I think it's it's really needed to get tools <laughs> before things are broken. <clears throat> so if you're at a point where communication is really significantly reduced, you do need tools to help calm the situation down. But often um, it'd just be so much easier to do before it gets to that point. Right. You, yeah. We hear so many clients say, oh, I wish I'd found you like six months ago or 12 months ago or 
five years ago or sometimes 20 or 30 years ago. Um, and I raised my hand. I know that those who are watching the video can, could see that, but when, uh, you know, Mark was talking about how most of us would benefit from an outside perspective to maintain a relationship. You know, having a coach back when my marriage was really struggling was fundamental because I couldn't see it. I was too much in the challenge myself to see it for what it was. And so having a coach who had the kind of marriage I wanted was so crucial to be able to get that perspective on what I needed to do. You know, I tried the love dare, I tried the love languages, I tried therapy, I tried doing it myself, podcast books, YouTube videos, all that stuff, and none of it worked. So I was like, I need to find out from someone else who's gone through what I've been through, what's really gonna work here. And so that was huge for turning things around at that point. And since then, I continue to have relationship coaching. Like there is no pride in me that's going to say, I've got it all figured out just because I'm here with Mark Johnston on, and as an owner of High Thrive Coaching, where we coach marriages, right? Every coach that I know has a coach themselves. Why? Because to me, it's not just about surviving. It's not just about getting through. It's not just having an okay relationship. It's about thriving. And that's our fundamental principle here. And I want to be a living, breathing example of that. And so Right now, Ben and I are working with a relationship coach on some of the challenges and dynamics that we're going through right now. And that's awesome. That's a good thing. That's to be celebrated. So rather than feeling shame about it or hesitancy, um, it's powerful to be able to get perspective and we can always improve. I don't know about you, Mark, but I feel like I'm ever the student, never the master. And putting myself in that kind of situation allows my mind, my heart, my soul to be open to expand and become even better and better and better. So it's a good thing. <laughs> no, I, I agree. And and for me personally, I'll, I'll say that you know, spending most of my day <laughs> listening to other people's problems, um, it's really relieving sometimes to be able to just go to someone and ask questions myself. Uh, to get support from someone else, to have someone <laughs> give me some advice, and just you know, once again, have that outside perspective. It's, there's a reason why, you know, people like going to seek some professional help because they're here's someone who's absolutely going to listen to you and, you know, tell you how it is. So. Right. I think that's a powerful, beautiful thing to say. I want to evolve. I want to become better. Um, that is not a sign of any kind of weakness. It's a sign of strength to say that I am where I am. And yeah, we can always become a little better. We can always understand more. We can always connect with our partner better. And we don't just settle for an okay marriage. We don't settle for just a humdrum marriage. We don't just settle for going through the motions, but we settle, we don't settle at all. We have a freaking awesome marriage and that's it, period. <laughs> so with that being said, if you are wanting more help with your relationship, I encourage you to book a consultation with us. This is completely free and you can do that over at highthrivecoaching.com slash apply. So we've got two, two things there for you guys. The teaser of the workshop where we're going to go deep into this. We're going to give you examples of really common text messages that our clients get and how you can best respond. We'll go deeper into the messages you should never send. And we'll go uh, deeper into how to show your spouse that you are an ally and help them to want to spend time with you. If you're needing more help beyond that with the bigger picture, you want to do the root assessment, you want to get really good results in your marriage as fast as humanly possible, then that's how we have the coaching. And you can join that by booking that free consultation, highthrivecoaching.com slash apply. So I'm done sending like an infomercial, <laughs> but I really hope that this was valuable and, uh, and helpful for you today. I hope that you can see that Mark and I, we've got our, our hearts into this and we're here to help you no matter where your relationship is so that you can truly, truly thrive. All right. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Mark. And we will talk to you guys uh, next time. Have a great see day. You. Thanks for listening to The Thriving Marriage, your A to Z blueprint for not just surviving marriage, but thriving. Until next time, my friends, thrive on.